Today's presenter, Mukulika Pahari, joined the NumPy documentation team almost exactly a year ago as a participant of Google Season of Docs 2021. And today she's presenting the tutorial that is one of many excellent contributions that she has made to NumPy to date. Mukulika, please take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Anissa, for introducing me. Uh, so, yeah, I have worked on um, a number of contributions throughout my season of docs uh, tenure, and um, this tutorial is one of them. I'll give a brief uh, overview of the tutorial. I'll go through it. And if anyone has any questions or if you would like to discuss anything, I request you to ask uh, everything at the end. I uh, won't be taking questions in the middle because I am uh, quite new to this and I want to mess up anything. So yeah, with that, I'll share my screen. Um, so this is the uh, tutorial we're talking about and I'll post a link to that in the chat. Uh, so this is uh, the title of this tutorial is Analyzing the Impact of the Lockdown on Air Quality in Delhi. Um, Delhi is one of the most polluted, uh, air polluted cities in India. It is quite infamous for it. There have been a lot of um, ongoing efforts to reduce that, but um, things, uh, things might get better, I'm hopeful. So let's uh, look at what we'll do in this tutorial. We are going to calculate the air quality indices and perform paired students t test on them. Now, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with these uh, uh, terms, we'll look at them later in the tutorial. So no need to worry. And what will we learn? So we learn the concept of moving averages, which is a statistical method to um, uh, basically remove out layers in data. Then uh, we'll calculate the air quality index and we will perform a paired student's t-test and find the ENT values. And then finally, we'll learn how to interpret these values. So for our environment, uh, uh, you will, if you are running this tutorial locally, then you will need SciPy uh, installed in your environment. And uh, of course, NumPy, because this is a NumPy tutorial. And um, it would be good if you have some basic understanding of um, statistical terms like population, sample, mean, et cetera. But it's okay if you don't. Um, this is not a very mathematically heavy tutorial. Uh, so just a brief introduction. Um, I already told you why I chose um, this um, uh, to analyze the evolution in Delhi. And um, um, I mean, it's always good to spread more awareness about these um, uh, these problems that we face. And um, so let's just begin by importing NumPy and SciPy. Uh, so in this tutorial, these libraries have already been imported. This uh, tutorial has already been run. So we don't need to do anything here. But in case you want to run it by yourself, then you can launch it on Binder here or you can run it locally on JupyterLab or Jupyter Notebook. Um, so first of all, let's look at the data set. Um, I used a condensed version of the air quality data in India data set, which is available on Kaggle. It, um, it is a big data set with many cities and it ranges from 2015 to 2020, if I'm not wrong. And I have only used um, uh, the small part of it, which pertains to Delhi um, between May 2019 and June 2020. So as you can see, um, there are many um, uh, there are many pollutants that are um, recorded here. 
uh, which we'll see in our own uh, data set as well. So you can see that there, there is a particle particulate matter 2.5, particulate matter 10, NO2, NH3, SO2, and all these pollutants that are uh, considered while calculating the air quality index. Um, so here I have printed out uh, the first um, uh, 10 uh, records, but if you want, you can look at the uh, uh, entire data set at uh, airqualitydata.csv. Uh, so for the purpose of this tutorial, we only need the standard pollutants that are used to calculate the air quality index, uh, which are PM 2.5, PM 10, NO2, NH3, SO2, CO, and ozone, O3. So if we want to selectively import these columns, then we will use nb.load text as I have here in this link. And we can um, define the exact range in which uh, of which we want to um, import the columns from. So I have imported columns one to eight. Uh, then for uh, the pre-processing or the moving averages part of the tutorial, I have sliced the pollutants, uh, pollutant data into two, because one of them has to be kind of averaged over a smaller uh, window and one has to be averaged over a larger window. So that is why I have initially uh, sliced them into two parts, which we will uh, again uh, merge later on after we have completed the uh, process. Uh, now, uh, here is a quick check to see if our data set has any empty values or any uh, infinite values, anything which is not supposed to be there, which is nice. Uh, so uh, we use nb.isfinite, which checks for the um, uh, NAND values and infinite values. And you can see that um, uh, here we can see that uh, the result is true, which means that our data does not have any uh, uh, anything which is not uh, uh, which is uh, infinite or which is not. So once our data set is ready, we will now look at the air quality index part. So the air quality index uh, is basically uh, an index which tells you how severely good or uh, bad or good your air quality is, as you can see in this table. There are six categories uh, into which uh, these, um, uh, into which the air quality is divided into. And to calculate it, there is a linear relationship between these uh, indices and the breakpoint averages. So if you look uh, carefully at this formula, it um, resembles the standard uh, line equation of y is equal to mx plus c. And if you want to um, read further on how this was come, uh, come up with and what is the process, then um, I have linked the research paper here, uh, which you can see here. It is uh, quite in depth. And uh, if you're interested, then please check it out. For now, we will uh, uh, look at this formula and we will uh, convert it into code, basically. Uh, now, the first step here is to uh, do a 24 hourly average for uh, the standard pollutants and eight hourly average in case of CO and O3. This is the reason why uh, we split the data into two at the beginning. And uh, then uh, with those averaged values, we will uh, plug them into this formula. And once we have our sub indices, then we will calculate the air quality index as we'll see later. So the first uh, part is um, uh, uh, making these averages. So uh, here is a common moving average function which takes in the uh, window size to slice 
your uh, entire array into those window sizes and gives them uh, and the computer average for those uh, window sizes. So uh, we uh, pass in our pollutants A and pollutants B, which are the two parts that we had uh, initially made. And once we have uh, these averages, you can see that I have sliced off some part uh, from the end, uh, from the beginning, because um, if you see in the 24 hour average um, uh, array and the data average array it will be unequal. So to equalize it, I have sliced off some part uh, from the beginning. Uh, so now that we have uh, averaged both of these, we can join them back together with NP concatenate. And we have this pollutant array, which is our final uh, uh, data set. Now, just uh, going back here, whatever we see in this chart, the uh, indices and the breakpoint averages, I have uh, put them into arrays here. These are helper arrays which we will use later on because uh, we need them for uh, to plug in into this formula. So now let's calculate the sub indices with this formula. Uh, here is a simple uh, if else chain, which basically uh, takes in the pollutant and the concentration. So if you look at this table, you'll see that each pollutant has a different um, concentration breakpoint. And we have to map these to the um, indices. So for that, uh, we need a different, um, uh, basically we need a different range for each pollutant. And that is why there is uh, an FLS chain. And uh, at the end of this is where we have plugged in the formula to calculate the sub index. Uh, sub indices. Uh, now, this uh, function that we see here, compute indices, is something that works for a single concentration value. But in our array, we have uh, we have a huge array of two thousand plus values, and uh, if we want to compute for each of them, we would have to write a for loop. But uh, NumPy has this function called vectorize which uh, basically eliminates the need for that for loop and uh, does that for us. So if we call an e dot vectorize on our function, then it gives a vectorized function that we can use. Now we use this vectorized function on each of our pollutant arrays. And then finally, we'll stack them together with np dot stack to get back the original shape of our pollutant uh, data set. Now, finally, uh, we have to calculate the air quality uh, indices for each day or each period. Uh, so uh, the way this air quality index is defined is that it is the maximum sub-index for each period. So for a day, you have the sub indices for each pollutant, uh, say uh, NH3, SO2, and everything. And the maximum of them for each period is the air quality index. So we use uh, NP.max on the first axis to get our AQI array, which will have all the uh, sub uh, all the air quality indices. So with that, we will have our entire AQI array from June 1st, 2019 to June 30, 2020, which is a significant period before the lockdown and after the lockdown. Now we'll move on to uh, doing the paired students t-test on the air quality indices that we just calculated. So a uh, paired student t-test is uh, a hypothesis test. Hypothesis testing is basically a statistical method to draw conclusions from uh, a population. I mean, if you already have, you have to already define a hypothesis and with the help of the population variance and uh, average, you can draw conclusions from it. So uh, for 
our uh, air quality indices. We'll look at the hypothesis first. So we will assume, uh, so this is called the null hypothesis. We'll assume that there is no significant difference between the sample means before and after the lockdown, which means that the air quality did not improve due to the lockdown. And our alternate hypothesis is something which is the opposite of the null hypothesis, which will be that there is a significant difference between the means and the air quality index improved. So now let's jump back. Uh, to prove these hypotheses, we are going to look at this um, graph here to understand it a little better. So this is the normal distribution of our data. And we are going to see that if um, uh, we are going to calculate these uh, uh, test statistics, the uh, statistic and p value, which, which are um, which are basically, uh, they are called uh, test statistics and they represent uh, some part of the data. And uh, so these values, if they fall um, outside of the critical value, then we can say that we can reject our uh, null hypothesis. Uh, so let's uh, go forward and look into it. For, so first we need to create samples from our population. Uh, for this, um, uh, for the student's uh, t-test, we will take a sample of uh, 30. So before that, we have done this uh, step where we import the date time column from our initial uh, uh, data set. If you see, there is a date time column. Uh, this is so that we can accurately uh, create samples from before and after the lockdown according to uh, those time periods. So this is where we import the date time uh, column. And we use this column to basically index our uh, air quality indices array. And usually in uh, uh, nowadays we can use pandas to do this quite easily. But since we are sticking only to NumPy and SciPy here, so this is uh, how you index your uh, now index your air quality index array. Uh, so uh, basically, we create two uh, uh, two halves of the um, uh, uh, our original AQI array, which is after the lockdown and before the lockdown. So here you can see that. With the help of uh, NP dot date time sixty four, which is um, uh, which is a function to deal with uh, date times, we have used these uh, uh, dates to index our uh, AQI array, and uh, with the help of that, we have created after lockdown and before lockdown two parts of the uh, of the array. And from these two, uh, we'll further uh, use the random choice um, generator to uh, create our final samples on which we will uh, prove our hypothesis. So here you can see we have used size 30 and uh, without replacing the values of course, uh, we have uh, used uh, the generator dot choice function to generate our samples. So we have these two samples, the four sample and after sample. Uh, now we've already looked at what our hypothesis is. Now we'll have to calculate the test statistic. So uh, for the test statistic T, the T statistic is given uh, with this formula, which is the difference between the means uh, and uh, divided by the square root of uh, the uh, near variances, with, which is basically the standard deviation divided by the sample size. And uh, so this is where I have defined this uh, formula the, in the t-test uh, function. Uh, this is exactly the same thing, uh, just uh, written here with the help of uh, NumPy's variance function and mean function and square root function. And uh, 
this is something which you can directly find in uh, SciPy, uh, SciPy's uh, t-test uh, test statistics. I will uh, visit that later on. So uh, with the help of this function, we find that p-value. Now from this t-value, we can also find the p-value. And uh, I mean, uh, I know these uh, values sound very arbitrary. I'm just um, giving them names t-value and p-value, but that's just how uh, it is. And uh, they make sense, uh, sense later on when we actually see it uh, with the help of our uh, tables. So uh, we uh, have calculated the value and then we will calculate our P value with the help of uh, this uh, P uh, uh, distribution that we get from SciPy. And the formula for that is uh, uh, given here. Uh, this is also something which you can directly get from the SciPy t-test uh, function. So once we have our t-values and our p-value, let us look at how to interpret these values. So the t-value can be uh, interpreted by this t-distribution table, which uh, I'll just give you a look here. So this is the t distribution table in which you just see where your p value lies to uh, according to the confidence level to see if your um, uh, result is statistically significant. So we'll be using the 95% confidence level. What that means is that uh, whatever result we get at the end, how uh, so it is only 95, uh, it is only 5% probable that the result was gotten by chance. And it is 95% um, uh, probable that uh, it was not uh, by chance, so it must be correct. So we'll look at the smaller version of this table, where we'll see that our value is um, minus 6.715. And uh, if we see in the 95% confidence of uh, yeah. In the 95% confidence level, if you uh, see, then uh, it falls under uh, under 1.699. Uh, 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 and uh, we choose that row because of the degrees of freedom, which I think I skipped. Yeah. So the degrees of freedom uh, is something which is uh, the length of the sample minus one. And according to that, uh, you have to locate your value in the table. And uh, now uh, we can uh, interpret this value by going back to our graph. So basically our critical value is here minus 1.699 and here plus 1.699. And our uh, calculated value was minus six point uh, something. So it clearly lies below minus uh, 1.699. That means we can um, reject the null hypothesis. And our null hypothesis was that there is no uh, significant, uh, statistically significant change between the air quality index before and after the lockdown. Now, this also does not mean that we can uh, completely accept the alternate hypothesis. Um, so that is not how it is interpreted. But we can definitely say that uh, the null hypothesis can be rejected. Now, this can be uh, further uh, supported if we look at the p-value. Uh, the p-value, which is denoted by alpha, is um, the threshold for that is usually 0 0.05, according to the 95% confidence level. And uh, if our calculated p-value is less than this threshold, then again, we can reject our null hypothesis. So our p-value is um, 1.14 uh, into 10 raised to minus 7. So it is quite small, and it is definitely less than 0 0.05. So we can say that we uh, reject the null hypothesis. Uh, so this is 
the end of our tutorial. Now, a couple of points that um, I'll again go, um, I'll go on. So the Pandas library has, uh, uh, is better for time series data analysis because um, we don't need to do this hack where we import the date time column and uh, then index with that and everything. It is, um, everything is quite um, abstracted over there and it's quite easy. And in the SciPy stats module, you can directly use a t-test uh, function. Uh, yeah, so this uh, t-test function will take in two uh, samples, A and B, and it will give you your uh, t-test uh, t statistic and the p-value, which uh, we require for an analysis. And uh, one more point to be uh, kept in mind is, um, so, uh, the data that we uh, looked at uh, in this graph, I said that this is uh, the normally, distribu uh, normally distributed data, but usually real life data is not normally distributed. So there are tests like uh, Wilcoxon's test, which are for non-normal data, which are used for real life data. So that is also a, a good alternator. And uh, if anyone wants to read further, then uh, there are these references and there is also the uh, research paper that I had linked earlier, which has the um, entire derivation for the air quality indexes. So yeah, this was basically the walkthrough and um, let's see if we have any questions in the chat. Thank you, Makulika. Now we're opening the floor for questions. Since we don't have a huge crowd, you can use audio if, if you prefer or post your questions in the chat. Uh, hello. Hi. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah, this is a new mic, so I'm just checking. Uh, so uh, could you share more on the, what does the T and P values mean? Uh, what does this signify and what does, uh, because I, you mentioned a Wikipedia table where we used a column value, where we had a 95% and we used a common value of 1.699 as I can mention, as I can see on the docs as well. Could you share more on that, please? Uh, so I would uh, redirect you to the, Wikipedia page because um, I think if you read uh, about the derivations more then you'll um, understand better. But uh, for the purpose of this tutorial, I have uh, just maintained that these are test statistics, which uh, later on when we use uh, the tables, then that is when we get some meaning from it. Uh, by themselves, they don't mean much. Uh, like a variable? Um, it is um, not really a variable. It is a calculated value about the data. So it is, it represents some information about the data. And T and P are terminologies? Yeah. Okay, okay. Makalika, we have another question in the chat from Rohit. Perhaps a question about the implementation. Is this a Jupyter notebook or a missed markdown? Is it binder compatible? I see the rocket icon is there. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a, a missed uh, markdown notebook. Uh, so we have used uh, Jupytext to convert the Jupyter notebook into MySD. Uh, into a MySD notebook, and uh, it is binder uh, compatible since uh, the build is not breaking. So yeah. Thank you, Makalika. And then uh, another question from Apple. Uh, thank you for the tutorial. I'm not familiar with the vectorized function. What does it do exactly to the input function? Okay. So let's go to the API reference for that.
just take this image. All right, so uh, they, uh, the vectorized function basically takes in your Python function and uh, it uh, basically pulls in a loop to make it, uh, uh, to make sure it, um, you don't need a loop to go over every element of the array. I mean, on a high level, uh, that is what I can tell you. And if you want to know more about the implementation, maybe, uh, the developers here can help you out. And everyone, please keep in mind that uh, Mukulika is on Slack. So if you have any questions uh, later, uh, you can reach out. Uh, probably the best way would be in the docs channel. So everyone, um, other people who might have similar questions can read uh, your answers as well. Let me see if there are more comments so in the chat. I wanted to just uh, point out uh, the uh, fact that Sebastian put in the chat that vectorize won't make your code fast. Uh, it will only uh, help you simplify your code. There's a question from Mars. Great tutorial. You you did quantitative analysis. How about qualitative? How did the air feel? I'm sorry, it's moving. Uh, how did the air feel and change where you live? Uh, oh, that's my question. I was just yeah. curious. <laughs> personally, I think it is much better. It is quite better. And um, I mean, the trees here are cleaner. I don't know if this is a problem where you live, but most of the time trees here are covered in dust, but that really went away after the lockdown, so yeah. I don't see any more questions. Yeah, actually I had a question. Uh, awesome. So, yeah, I don't know if it's like a very basic question, but uh, what I wanted to know is, is there like a minimum threshold of data points that we need for this, uh, you know, to work or, um, you know, what is the tipping point where we can say that this is from this size of data set onwards, we can use this and we can't. Yeah, so for the student's data set, it is uh, recommended that you uh, use a sample of 30. Uh, with a sample size of 30 and different tests have different um, recommended sample sizes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. And also that will be the minimum and I'm guessing there won't be any maximum to apply this test, right? Or is there a maximum limit as well? Yeah, there is a maximum actually. So um, for the student's t test 30 is the recommended and you can go a, like, a little above and little below. But that is actually the average uh, size that it should have. And I oh. mean, uh, as it is with any statistical thing, like the more points you have, the better. So, uh, I mean, I can't really say about the minimum value. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, very helpful. There are some comments in the chat. So Melissa pointed out uh, if uh, any in, anyone in the audience would like to contribute to tutorials, NumPy tutorials, check out the link that you posted. And yeah, I just uh, I'll just get the tutorial uh, style guide if anyone wants it because that's really helpful and to help you structure out your tutorial. Yeah, so if you have an idea for a tutorial, please share with us in the docs channel or during the next documentation meeting. And uh, yes, we would love to have more tutorials. Also, Rohit, 
commented that sample sizes are notoriously hard to specify due to awkwardness related to p-hacking. I don't know what p-hacking is, but it sounds right. So <laughs> that, that happens because you want to see an effect, right? And you say it's a significant effect if you have a p-value of less than this. So then you just play around with the data until you get a p-value less than that. And so maybe you add more data, maybe you add less, maybe you drop a few points. Yeah. Sounds like something does this clickbait, uh, you know, <laughs> articles that we see would do. Yeah, that's also why the P value is the journalist's best friend because everybody misinterprets it very happily. They'll be like significant effect found, P value less than blah. And then it's like on two data points or something weird like that. <laughs> Um, by the way, Rohit, you were saying something that something redirects to 404. Uh, what exactly? Right. Um, I, I put it in the channel as well. So if you go to the tutorial mm -hmm. and you try to edit it, so it redirects to a markdown document which doesn't exist. So you get a 404. Pavuk, I see your question about an invite to the Slack channel. Uh, I will post it uh, in just a minute. Um, in the meantime, all right, Mikulika, uh, please go ahead with what you want to share next. Uh, yeah, so I'll just uh, share a few tips or advice for the season of dogs. And um, uh, so basically for NumPy, I would say that um, uh, it is important to go through the current documentation and the plans that uh, have already been made for the documentation. So that is uh, the NEP uh, 44, which has, um, which basically outlines what the uh, NumPy community wants their documentation, their documentation to look like in the future. So, I mean, personally, I feel that for uh, mature projects like these, it is best to um, go along with what uh, the community has already decided upon uh, before you even came in. So, I mean, they have already deliberated on it and they have um, made plans for it. So, it is good if you go through them, then you will also align your goals according to the project goals. That's an excellent advice from Kolika. All right, do we have any more questions? If you think of, uh, as I mentioned before, if you think of the questions uh, later on, feel free to post them on the Slack channel called Docs. Well, uh, I think uh, we will be closing the event then. Uh, Mukulika, thank you so much for being generous with your time and sharing your knowledge with the community. Your commitment to the project and the excellent work are much appreciated. Uh, thank you for having me. And everyone, thank you for joining us. It was nice to see some new faces and our uh, old timers. Uh, thank you for supporting us. If you have suggestions for future topics or general comments, please send me a message on Slack or via Twitter. And everyone have a great day. Bye. See you Bye. next time. Bye.